So, um, HP2, plug to Phoenix, Cowboy 2. I've never sighed before once given my talk title, but that's what I came up with. Uh, if you need help with your talk title, then, you know, find someone else. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about where we are um, and how things work at the moment, and then where we might be going and how things might work in the future. So, we're going to talk about plug. There are two things that people mean. Um, first off, you hear like a plug, which could be a function plug or a module plug. And this is, uh, I mean, I stole this from websites, a specification for composable modules. But this is um, a function or a module that takes this plug.construct, which has kind of everything you need for a HTTP request, so headers, um, session stuff, you know, and the parameters, and optionally does some sort of transform on it, and then will return a new um, plug.construct. And you can kind of chain these together in a way that you can build up a request and things can happen to it over time. Um, and then eventually it'll be sent to the browser. Uh, but the other thing the plug can, can do is it's like an interface for web servers. So um, you can use it for configuring a web server or starting a web server. Um, and plug at the moment has like a HP 1.1 feature set. So that means that it'll support, um, for example, the options request, but it won't support web sockets or you know, any HTTP 2 features. Um, so if you look at a plug that's a module, um, this is the Hello World plug. You can probably guess what it does. Uh, so you define your module, and then there's a behavior, there's the plug behavior, which has two functions, um, init and call. And um, normally you'll import plug.con into your module so that you don't have to put like plug.con.putResponseBody. body. Um, you can just call put response body. Uh, and there's an init function which takes some options and then returns some options which will be passed to the call function. Um, this can be called at compile time as well. And then, uh, yeah, when you have call, it will be, they'll be used in there. Uh, I'm using the Elixir 1.5 impl flag, so this ensures that the um, behavior um, is, you know, cons is consumed correctly. So you go to the functions, and if you miss any, then it'll error, and you won't be able to compile. And uh, the call function takes the con, which is like say a plug.construct, and uh, in this instance, it's putting the response content type to text plane, and setting the response 200 hello world. Um, so that's kind of simple example. It's probably the most simple plug you'll see. Um, here's a slightly more complicated example. So maybe you've got a blog, and you've got like a Phoenix controller, for example, and you have a few functions in there that need to act on a post. So you maybe want to either delete a post or update a post. It's handy for it to be available. So we have this post finder that we might have in our controller for those particular actions. Um, again, there's an init function, and then the call. We're ignoring the options because we're not doing anything with them. Uh, so if you imagine there's this blog module. Um, if you can't read the code, by the way, just use your imagination. So <laughs> if we imagine there's this blog module, and on there there's a get post function uh, taken straight out of Phoenix 1.3 context examples. Uh, there's an ID on the params, and we fetch the post. And if it returns OK post, then we assign it. And assign is a map that's available on plug.com. You can put things in there and then reference them later on. So when we get to our delete action, we can get the post from there and then call delete on it. And the other thing that can happen is it's not found, in which case you'll want to send a 404. And then we call halt. So because plug is built up of pipelines, um, when you call halt, it ceases to call subsequent pipelines. It just says, OK, we're done. Look, there's no, no point in continuing without the post. You won't be able to do anything. So we halt and return a 404. Uh, but that's not the part I'm going to talk about. Um, that's just a little, little introduction. So um, plug, Who, who's used plug? Again, if you've used Phoenix, um, you've also used plug, by the way. So uh, yeah. And who has used Cowboy without using plug? Well, I found the Erlangers. OK. <laughs> who has used, wait, which one have I done? OK, so who's used plug without using Cowboy or the test adapter? OK, one part two. OK, you guys use like Chatterbox or something maybe. So there's not many people who have used other adapters. Um, plug, it ships with Cowboy uh, or the Cowboy adapter, which is by far the most popular. And it supports Cowboy 1.x 1, 1 at the moment, so 1.1 or 1.0. Uh, and there's a test adapter as well. So if you've done any tests in Plug or Phoenix, then you'll have used the test adapter. Uh, and it will just like, allow you to assert the response that comes back. And the adapter is stored in the plug.construct as well. So you can um, reference it later on if you want to call functions with the, the adapter. You need to know which adapter you're using. Um, this is a git log on plug. So it's the initial commit, and then uh, the next commit says start with Cowboy support. So I think it's fair to say that when plug was being developed, it had Cowboy in mind. Um, 
This is, if you're wondering how I get such a good git log, this is my git config, so feel free to take a photo of that. This is probably not my only git slide, but let's pretend it is. Um, so yeah, git. Um, let's talk about Cowboy. Um, so it's an Erlang web server. Um, I think it's probably been started development about five years ago. Um, it's quite, quite popular, and it's certainly the most popular one on Hex. Um, it has two main dependencies. It was Ranch and it was Cowlib. So Ranch is like a TCP acceptor library. So it will handle the requests and then pass them to Cowboy to do its thing. And there's Cowlib, which has a set of common functions for handling um, HTTP requests or HTTP stuff. So it does like header parsing and MIME types. And Cowlib is also used in um, a client library called Gun. You can probably see a theme of the author's naming conventions. Um, they all have a Wild Westy vibe. So um, Gun is like the HTTP client, and it uses the same um, underlying library as the server. So I, that's probably a common reason why it's been extracted. And if you're writing your own web server, you could consider using Cowlib to save you a lot of work with some of that stuff. Um, Cowboy, when you use it directly, you use a Cowboy handler, which is a module. So I'm going to show you um, a fairly simple Cowboy handler. Uh, I took this one from the Cowboy examples and um, converted the code to Elixir. But if you want to look at the Erlang implementation, just have a look on the Cowboy repository. So there's an init function which takes a type, which is um, HTTP or uh, HTTPS. It's the type that's being used for the request, the transport type. Uh, and then there's the request record. Um, which is a cowboy record that you use to call functions um, with a request so you can reply to it and so on. Uh, and then there's options which you pass through when you start cowboy. Uh, and then there's the handle function. So if you return OK, request, and then your state, which we're not using in this case, we're just passing nil. But if you return that, then the next thing will be called as handle. And that takes the request and the state that you set in the init function. And then you can reply using cowboy request reply. Um, and it takes a status code, a list of pairs, which are the headers, and then the response body and the, the actual request object. So when you're using an Erlang library, it's fairly common for the, the subject or the context to be the last argument, whereas in Elixir, we usually do the first arguments that you can pipe. Um, but it's fairly common to see at the end. And then there's a terminate if you need to do any, any cleanup. Uh, and then there's this dispatch function, which um, uses cowboy root compile. So it takes a data structure that is the host, which, and then the host has a list of um, like paths. And we're, if you use an underscore, it's a match all. So we're saying for every request here, go to the Cowboy Handler module. And then Cowboy itself has a start HTTP function. Uh, the first argument's an identifier. Then we have the number of acceptors, the port that's running on, uh, and then finally the Cowboy options, which takes the dispatch. Uh, what, was, what was that? Do I have an example of this? Yeah, I, I can show you it running. That's fine, don't worry. So if I run mix run no halt, um, it's probably called hello world. Right. And then if I go to the browser, you guys are waiting in suspense. I can tell. It's not on that port. And go local is 5,000. There. Right there. That. <laughs> the demo gods are with me this day. OK, that was awesome. So uh, here's a slightly more complicated example. Oh, this is actually what the um, Cowboy Router Compile function does. So it takes this data structure, which has a, ho a list of hosts. So we've got foo.com in this case. Um, and then we've got this path, which is foo, and then an optional foo ID, and then bar, and then um, sorry, a required foo ID, and an optional bar ID. And now we've got the foo handler, and everything else we've got the baz handler. And then it returns this new data structure, which is a little bit more complicated, um, which Cowboy matches on. And you can use that data structure at the bottom directly if you want, but I've never seen that done. Everyone uses the the convenience compile function. So there's a slightly more complicated example. Um, the code here, by the way, it's like non-sequential, and that's not like a functional programming joke or anything. That's like, you know, just if you fall asleep during one of them, um, wake up later, you'll probably be able to catch up. So the post handler is slightly different. It's got an init function again. But this time, in the handle, we're fetching the request. So Cowboy has these functions that act on the request, and one of them is method, and that will return the method and a new request. Um, and then we're calling this private function handle methods. This is saying, like, use this as a match. And then if it's a post request and we read the body and there's a name argument there, then we'll say created user in a 201. Otherwise, we'll turn a 422, say missing name parameter. Um, and for any other method, we'll say it's an invalid method and return a 404. Um, a 405 would probably be more appropriate here, but I've already written the slides. So um, just do the substitution in your head and it'll be fine. <laughs> and then we reply. This time we do a text plane. Um, and then we have the response string, and then we have two new lines there and there. So if I demo this, then it won't butt up against the prompt. 
Um, let's demo this. So again, this is fairly simple. Um, it's a post example, runs on a different port. So I can curl it with uh, put, and then I can go to localhost 5001, and it says invalid method put. And if I do a post, invalid method ppost, because that's not a valid one either. And then if I do post, we get a missing name parameter. Uh, and if I do the data, um, equal, no, it's, it's that uh, name equals Gary. Then we created user Gary. So again, a slightly more complicated example, but you can see it takes the same sort of shape as the previous one. And I have one more that I'll go over quickly, which is a chunked handler. So we start a chunked reply, and you give it the status code. Um, this will all become relevant shortly. And then we send a response, a chunk, and then we sleep, and then send another chunk, and then we sleep, and then send the final one. And if I just run that example quickly as well, then you'll see. I can actually use the same like post request because I'm ignoring the method and I'm ignoring the path and everything, so that will do hello world chunked. Again, you see it waits a second between each one. So those are some of the features of Cowboy and Cowboy request requests that you can use in Cowboy 1. And with this knowledge, we can see how um, Cowboy and Plug work together. So there are three modules that are required for this. Excuse me. So we have the adapter module, which is responsible for the configuration and actually starting Cowboy. Uh, so I've taken this code from Plug and the Cowboy adapter and deleted lots of code and called it Cowboy Min. So a lot of the code in the module is for SSL support, which I'm ignoring because it's um, complicated. But that's the bulk of the code in the module. If you want to see that, go have a look at the repository. Uh, so there's a HTTP function. There's also a HTTPS one, which is why um, you don't just call run directly. The other one called run with HTTPS. But it just delegates to run. And then the run function takes the scheme and the plug and the options that you pass through. Uh, and then Cowboy has its own options. Checks that Cowboy's running and then uses apply. So apply is a function on kernel that allows you to dispatch a function to a module. So in this case, we're calling star underscore HTTP on the Cowboy module which is the exact same function we called in the handler directly. Um, and then we build up the arguments using this args function. Um, and it has, um, there are two different types of arguments. So there's keyword arguments and there are, uh, are um, non-keyword arguments. So keywords in Elixir are implemented as a list of pairs where the um, first element of the tuple is the key and the last element is the value. So this particular line of code is checking for all the tuples of size 2 and pulling them into keyword arguments so that it, they can be acted on using the functions in the keyword arguments, so you know, keyword put new or keyword delete, however. And everything else, that could be atoms, three tuples, four tuples, lists, um, get pulled into other arg arguments, which are the cowboy options. Um, and then we're using the dispatch function again, the compile function to build the dispatch. And this is exactly the same as the other examples. It's saying for every host and every path, go to the cowboy handler. Uh, and the cowboy handler is pretty much the same as the handlers I showed earlier. Uh, but it's responsible for handling the request for plug. Um, and it has the same style. So it has in it, but this time instead of returning OK request state, we return upgrade protocol module request and then the options. Uh, and when you do that, we're using something called cowboy submodules. Um, and this is mainly for like error handling, so we can do better stack traces. Um, and when you do that, it will call the upgrade function instead. And the upgrade function takes the request, uh, the environment, which was passed through earlier, and the module, and then the options we provided. And from that, we call this con function, uh, the connection module attribute references a module, so we're calling the con function on that module with a request and the transport. And then we pattern match to make sure that the adapter returns correctly, because um, we use that later on. And then we call on plug.call, so that's the call function. When I showed the plug at the start, there was init and call, so um, that's what calls the call function. And then we maybe send. So in plug, you can build a response without actually sending it, in which case when maybe send is called, it will, if there's a response sent, but set but not sent, it will send at that point. Uh, and then Cowboy expects you to prepend this result OK, and that's um, something that Cowboy understands, and we're prepending that to the environment to say that the response has been sent. Uh, and there's one other, so this is the actual part where plug interfaces with Cowboy. So if you're building your own adapter, you'd have something similar and you'd call the functions there. Um, so it calls the Cowboy functions, uh, and it's also an implementation of the plug.con.adapter behavior, which requires five uh, functions to be implemented. There's send response, send file, send chunked, chunk and read request body. 
Um, except for send file, most of them will seem familiar because those are the specific demos I gave when I was doing the cowboy handler. Um, there used to be a sixth one, which was for multi-part um, uploads, but that's now been extracted into plugs. So if you're writing your own adapter, it's a lot easier because you don't need to handle multi-part uploads. Um, and well, that was loud. So it has um, the con function, which is for building up the plug.construct. And it's using these functions I showed earlier when I got the method from Cowboy. So it's using Cowboy request method, Cowboy request host path. And these return the method host and path and then add them to this construct. So when you're acting on the plug.construct, that's how it's been built um, using Cowboy at least. Uh, and then the owners and then the adapter as well, which I mentioned. Uh, and then this is the implementation of the, the functions for the behavior. So send response, which uses Cowboy request reply. The send file, which I've stubbed because it's complicated, but um, it's optimized by the operating system. Um, and the implementation is quite in depth, and I haven't shown it here. But again, if you want to have a look, go and have a look in the plug repository. Uh, send chunked, which I used in the chunked example. Um, chunk. Oh, by the way, these all return OK nil request. The nil in this case is the body. And if you're using the test adapter, this will actually have the body in it. And that's how you can do assertions on the response. Uh, chunk, and then read request body. Um, and that's how Cowboy 1 and Plug work together. So there's actually not a huge amount um, to it. It's just the functions in that last module. Um, Phoenix works a little bit differently. So as I mentioned, Plug only supports HP 1.1 um, semantics, whereas Phoenix requires the use of WebSockets. So Phoenix actually has its own handler, uh, which is the um, Phoenix endpoint cable handler. And this will match. Uh, when you create a Phoenix application, you have sockets, which you specify in your endpoint. And when you use a socket macro, it builds up a module attribute. And then when you use transport in your socket, it builds up a list of transports. And then these are used um, as paths that point to a handler. So you'll have like slash socket, slash web socket, and slash socket, slash long pole. And they'll each go to their own handlers. Um, and they'll be handled before you get to the catch-all, which is when you go into your router and handle things there. Uh, so you only have to implement the child spec function on the Phoenix endpoint handler behavior. Um, and you can override this uh, using the um, my app, my app endpoint handler option. And there are a few legitimate use cases for implementing your own handler. Like maybe you have an existing protocol that works over WebSockets, um, and it's not possible for you to use channels. Um, in that case, you'd use your own handler and handle your own WebSockets um, using the Cowboy WebSocket module directly. But most of the time, you probably use the default, and that's fine. Um, the other option is maybe you're building a Cowboy 2 adapter, and you need to override it there. Um, that's when I used it. So uh, speaking of Cowboy 2, uh, Cowboy 2 has been in development for quite some time now. Um, it's got a release date at the end of summer, apparently. Um, I <laughs> I don't know when the end of summer is, but Google does, and it told me it's the 22nd of September, but it didn't specify which year, so <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Um, if you want to see everything that's new in Cowboy 2, there's this uh, talk called A Tale of 2.0 Cowboys. There's the tiny little link there, but that's what I get for using JavaScript to render my slides. Uh, you're probably wondering why don't I just zoom in? Good question. That's why. <laughs> so um, a lot of the changes for Cowboy are internal. I mean, a lot of them are external as well, so it seems like a weird point. But it's <laughs> um, things like how many processes it uses and how it handles processes um, has been changed. Um, it has HTTP2 support, which is one of the, the big features. And, uh, but it also has like fallback to HTTP1. Um, it's, I think it requires OTP19. So all the options um, and headers are now passed as maps instead of lists of pairs. Um, there are other minor API changes. So for example, before as you start HTTP in Cowboy 2, it's start clear. Uh, and same with start HPS and start TLS. Um, you also notice the arrow is changed, so the argument that's been dropped is the number of acceptors. Um, you can now configure that with branch. Uh, and then the functions that I was using earlier, like path and method, instead of returning the thing that you want and then a new request, because they don't have side effects, uh, there's no real need for that. So they didn't now just return. If you use method, it will just return the method. Um, and then there are changes for the handler as well. Um, so a Cowboy 2 handler is a lot simpler than a Cowboy 1 handler. Um, it has an init function. It doesn't have a handle function anymore. And then you can reply straight away in your init, which is all I'm doing here with the cowboy request reply function. The um, reply function hasn't changed apart from the headers, which are now maps instead of um, lists of pairs. 
And we're, again, we're using start clear here with the HTTP identifier, the port, and then the cowboy options. Um, th this is my second Git slide because I did a Git diff, so it technically counts as a Git slide, but it's not really. Um, and the difference here is um, when we call init, there's no transport anymore. Um, and instead of calling upgrade protocol module request, uh, if you pass a module as the first argument um, when you're returning, then it will call the upgrade function on that. So you don't need to pass upgrade protocol, and this will be still using sub protocols. And then the upgrade function um, no longer takes the transport, so we're not passing it through to the con module. Not that we were using it anyway, but it's no longer passed. Uh, and then instead of prepending a pair, we pre use map.put new to say the result was okay. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's like the m bulk of the diff for um, Cowboy 2 um, upgrade for plug. Um, if you want to use Cowboy 2 in plug, then uh, there's an adapter library at this link here. Um, so Andrew Bennett, who's potato salad and GitHub, actually forked plug and Phoenix and made a lot of these changes for, I think, like, really, like version, I don't know, it was an early version of Cowboy 2 anyway. Um, and since then, I've extracted that code or stolen that code, whichever you prefer, into a library. And, and I maintained it, and it's up to date. I think it's for release candidate one, and release candidate two came out recently, so I probably need to update it. But the Cowboy 2 API is fairly stable, so it shouldn't be a massive change. Um, and if you're using this library, then instead of calling plug.adapters.cowboy.childspec, which you use if you're using plug directly, um, you'll use plug.adapters.cowboy2.childspec, um, and the arguments are the same. So the adapter handles all the conversion from lists to maps um, for you. Uh, okay, so one of the big features of Cowboy 2, as I mentioned, is HV2 support. So HV2 is uh, a protocol that is designed to, I guess, replace HTTP 1.1. Um, it started off as Speedy, um, Google were developing it, and it's now become like a, you know, a real spec. Um, it's, a, it's a binary format instead of textual, so when you use curl on HTTP 1, you'll see like all the lines, you'll see 200, okay, and then the headers and new lines. Um, HTTP 2 is binary, so it's more difficult to debug if you're using like Wireshark or something, um, but you can you can do it. And there's like tools like NGHP2 that you can use for HTTP2 requests, and it'll show you all the frames that are sent. Um, uh, you can seamlessly upgrade as well from HTTP 1.1 to HTTP2 using a, a header, so uh, you don't need to make a huge amount of change. Especially if you're using a web server that supports both, um, like Cowboy, then it'll just upgrade for you. Uh, if you're using other like things, there's Chatterbox, which are HTTP2 only um, web server in Erlang. If you're using that, then um, if you try and do a HTTP 1 request, it'll fail. Um, it supports both HTTP and HTTPS, but most browsers require that it's HTTPS. So that's why if you're doing local development um, and you need Cowboy 2 specific features, you'll probably want to consider using a self-signed certificate um, so that you can do HTTPS. And it has header compression as well, so a lot of the headers are common. So when a request comes in, instead of sending like the full header, you can just say, this is header one, and it'll look up a table and say, oh, header one's this. And then um, subsequent requests as well will use the same lookup table. And there's one in either direction as well. So there's one for incoming requests and one for outgoing requests. Um, because HP2 has like a single connection that's persistent. Uh, so you only have to do like the TCP handshake once, and then it opens individual streams, which can be initiated from either the client or the server. So when you request like index.html, that'll be one stream, and you request application.js, that'll be stream three. Um, and if you do application.css, that'll be stream five, because the client initiated stream start with an odd number, and server initiated start with an even number. Um, one of the features of HP2 that um, people are for some reason excited about is server push. And this is a way to send a preemptive response. So, for example, you request index.html, and the server goes, oh, you want index.html, you're probably going to want application.css and application.js and logo.png. Um, and then it's up to the client to go, whoa, no, I don't want your application.js, don't give me that. Um, and it'll send a reset stream, which will cancel the, the command. Uh, or it'll send a reset stream frame, which will cancel the request. Um, and then when you go and fetch it from the browser, it'll go, oh, I've already downloaded that, I'll just fetch it. And that uses the push promise frame, which you can read about in the spec, which I think is RFC 7540, um, probably. So you, you can read that. Um, so let's have a look at server push in action. Um, it's probably this. So you'll see I'm starting two servers here, one on localhost 4002, one on localhost 4001. Uh, one is HTTP and one is HTTPS. Uh, that's just a convenient way for me to toggle between HTTP and HTTP2. So if I go to my browser, oh, that demo's still there. Awesome. Um, if I go to 4002, 
I'm going to open up the net tab as well. I'll go at this, so this is one running on HTTP. Um, and you'll see it's loading quite slowly. So I have a plugin here called Dialup, which um, adds an artificial delay to all my requests. Um, I'm just going to run you through some of these pictures. Bear with me. So up here we have a chart you may have seen before. Um, it's this one. And then we have uh, the best-selling Phoenix book, which is Gary Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> I should have probably scrolled down. Um, here's me and Keith, and underneath there's a unicorn. Um, and then here, so this is weird, this is a picture of me pointing to this slide. <laughs> um, how, how did that happen? So you guys have actually, this whole talk's just me for my magic show. Um, <laughs> so, you know, try and work out how the magic's done. Uh, I've forgotten what I was doing. <laughs> Look, here's the unicorn. And it also says you're not using HTTP2, which is correct. Anyway, the point of this was, like I say, for my magic show, but also to show you that all these images are loading slowly. There's like a three-second delay, and there's a timeline here that you can see. Um, but if we load this over the HPS one, which is local 4001, then you'll see all the images load in faster. Uh, the logo doesn't because that's not being server pushed. And if we look here in the net tab, you know that all these are being pushed because the browser tells us. So that's um, how you can identify that. It says push and there's no timeline or anything and they've loaded in it all at the same time. Um, yes, yeah, so that's uh, how server push works. And I'll show you the code behind it. So um, because plug doesn't have HP2 semantics, I've created a new module called plugcon h2. And in there's a push function which just calls the push function on the adapter. Uh, and when you call the push function, the adapter, it calls cowboy request push. So the cowboy 2 re request module has a push function on it now, which if you use it on HTTP 1, it's a no-op, which is why it still worked before. And if you use it on HTTP 2, then it will actually do a server push frame. And it takes the path, the headers, and the request, um, like, like a lot of functions in cowboy do. And then we can use this. Uh, so here's an example. We're, using, we're pushing the CSS, and we're using the accept header you need to provide which is the MIME type. And then here's the Phoenix controller for the application I just showed. So that's the bit of code that tells you whether you're using HTTP 2 or not. Um, so it's not related to server push. That's just, um, it was already there. And then I have a list of the assets. So I've got my app.css, my app.js, and then my four pictures, chart.png, which was the chart, book.jf, which was the book, unicorn, and then magic, which was how the magic trick worked. Um, <laughs> And then I'm going over all these, and I'm calling my h2 push function. Um, when I'm setting the accept header, I'm just calling, using the MIME library, which that's going to be good. I'm using the MIME library, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, ships with plug and can be used for MIME stuff. So in this case, I'm using MIME.fromPath, which will work out the MIME type based on the file extension. Um, and then I'm just rendering it. OK, so that's server push. Um, the other thing that's interesting about HTTP2 is that the, um, the streams are, that's going to be, yeah, I'm going to turn this off. Um, the streams are bidirectional and persistent. And that kind of sounds a bit like web sockets. So when you build a Phoenix transport, um, you, can, you can do that. And Phoenix transports have web sockets and long polling by default that they ship with. Um, but you can, you can write your own transports and add them to Phoenix. So if you have another protocol you want to use, you can, you can build that. Um, and all you need is a function called default config, and you'll um, conform to the behavior. So using HP2, um, I wrote a HP2 adapter for Phoenix transports. And I gave a lightning talk on this at ElixirConf.eu. Um, and this is a screenshot from the lightning talk. And I gave it, and it was really good, and everyone loved it and said it was amazing. And then someone came up to me afterwards and said, Gary, how did you get the clock on your slides? And I was like, that's what you got from the... <laughs> Yeah, so that's how I knew everyone really enjoyed the talk. Um, so if, if we look at the module for the HP2 transport, um, it's, it's kind of compli complicated, but Phoenix has this transport module, which you can use for pretty much everything that's transport related, and it does all the hard stuff for you, like which channels you subscribe to and, and if you should reply. So we call connect, uh, and it takes six arguments that I'm not going to go over in detail. But that will either return OK socket or an error. And if it returns OK socket, um, I took most of this code from the long polling example, if it looks familiar, Eric. Um, that's why. So we check if there's an ID. And if there is, then we subscribe to the ID, because we'll assume that's the, the user channel. 
And then we go into a loop, um, and the loop takes the con and then a map of um, state. So uh, the, the most interesting thing here is that both channels and channels inverse are stored, and that's so the lookup can be optimized, so it works in either direction, either by the topic or by the PID. Um, and then we enter the loop, and most of this code at the top is just to make a reference. Um, so what we do is we make a reference, and then we send it to Cowboy, so the request PID is the Cowboy PID. And we can call this read body. Um, we can send a read body message because Cowboy doesn't have a way to read the body asynchronously at the moment. So the easiest way to do it is to send a message um, and send a timeout that's less than 60 seconds. So we've got a 30 second timeout here. And you'll get a reply at some point. Um, and the replies you can get are either request body and then the ref and then fin, in which case that's the end of the, re the request. There's no more data to read. Um, and in that case, we want to handle the body. Um, you can also get a no fin. Um, and if that's the case, then we also want to handle the body, but we want to um, remove the ref and then start keep looping because um, there's more data to read. And the other message we can receive, which doesn't come from Cowboy, this comes from uh, Phoenix PubSub, is a socket push message. And message. And if you get a socket push mes message, then uh, we'll want to send that down to the client. Um, and we do this using a private format reply function. And then we continue looping. And for everything else, we just loop. So when we get a message coming from Cowboy, uh, we will read the message using state.serialize.decode. So it's a bang method. Bang method, what am I doing? It's a function with an exclamation mark at the end. <laughs> and then we um, call transport.dispatch, which, uh, which returns various things that we can match on. So one of the things that we can match on is a no reply, in which case we don't have to do anything. We can just return OK state. Um, if we have to reply, then we'll need to encode the reply and send it down to the client. I'll show that function in a second. Um, if we get a joined, we also want to encode the reply, but we also want to update our state so that we keep the correct channels that the user subscribed to. And if there's an error, we also want to send the message to the client, but this time it's the error that happened. And we can send messages um, to the client using Cowboy Request Stream Body with a no fin. And again, that's because we're not terminating here. We're saying we want to keep sending you data so there'll be more to come so it won't close the connection. Um, HP2 connections, by the way, can be in several states. Um, they can be fully open or they can be half closed from either the client or the server. So if one of these was a fin, then that would close that half, and then when they both close, that's the end of the request. Um, so that's the, the transport, and that's how that... Oh, I should probably show that. That would be good. So uh, here's a Phoenix chat example that won't run because the port's used. Um, so this is running on port 4001. You may recognize this, uh, this application, by the way, so if you've seen it before. Um, so I can, you know, have a name here, say hi, ho, whatever. And then um, on the left here, I've got my uh, HP2 client that I, I built. So from the HP2 client, I can call start link, which will um, return a PID. And then on that PID, I can then open a stream. So this is a client-initiated stream. Um, so I'll call add stream, and then that returns one because it's a client initiated stream. Uh, I then have to join the channel, so let's make sure the log's set to debug, and then I will join the channel. And then you'll see straight away I start getting debug logs, so that's my join. And if I send a message here like, oh my god, it aucs. I'm not sure what aucs is, but that's fine. Uh, you'll see there's the message there being sent. So, um, so that's being sent from the Phoenix browser to over Phoenix PubSub, over channels, and being caught on my client. Um, and I'm going to set the log level to something that's not debug because this is irritating. So I'm going to set to warn or wham. That's not a level. Oh, it didn't like that. It did not like that. So <laughs> I'll set it to warn. It's OK. We can rejoin. So I'll get my PID. I'll get my stream. And I'll join my channel. And then once you join the channel, um, you can send an event. So I'm going to send an event. And right there, you can see it. There's an event from a HP2 client um, for Hello World. So that's going upstream over HP2. Um, yeah, so that's how that works. Um, and that's on GitHub as well, if you want to check it out. Uh, so here's some future ideas that I have. So here's a fun one. In Phoenix, we have the static path helper that you can use that returns a string. Why not introduce a side effect? So. <laughs> We could, when you call static path, um, it gets the path. We could just call server push from that, and then 
every page will be using server push automatically, and that could be fun, or it might not. Who knows? <laughs> but it works. I've tried it. It can, it can definitely work. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is in Ecto, there's a test suite for people who are building database drivers, and they can run the test suite against their driver, and it will tell them if it's working correctly or not. So there's one for Postgres. So you've, you know, you've got Postgres, you've got MariaX, you've got others. Um, and you can run them against the same test suite to make sure that they work with Ecto correctly. So we could do something similar for plug adapters to make sure that when you're developing your adapter, you can make sure it works with plug. You know, so if you're using the plug functions, then it works correctly for your adapter. Um, and the, the big one is um, come the 22nd of September when Cowboy 2 is out, uh, we, we could certainly make that default um, in some capacity in plug um, and in Phoenix as well. So there's a small thing that we need to do in Phoenix because Phoenix has its own handler for WebSockets, so we can't just update plug and go. We have to also update Phoenix so, so it works correctly. Um, and that's, that's all I got. So this is me. Um, I'm eating Jenga. That's how people recognize me. Uh, <laughs> I'd also like to mention uh, my company, Voicelayer, that I work for. Uh, a lot of the work here stem from our production use cases, so things like the channel client we've been trying out um, over HP2, so I'd just like to mention them as well. Uh, thank you. Yeah, go, go ahead. That would be much better with one. Okay, yeah. uh, the room is a little bit... Can you hear me? Okay. So the room is a little bit bigger. Uh, if you have questions, could you... Uh, we can take it from here. Yeah. Uh, questions? Oh, no. Oh, he's here, so... Uh, hi, do you have a way to set up a fallback? So if a browser does not support HTTP2, you'll be able to serve it HTTP1. So Cowboy has that already. So if you make a request to Cowboy using HTTP1, um, it'll, just, it'll just work. Like it's, it handles, which is why when I was showing you the HTTP and the HTTPS one, the HTTP one is being served um, over HTTP1 because the browser requires HTTPS for uh, HTTP2 requests. Um, and that's why it worked. Cowboy just did its thing and it, and it worked. So, yeah, you can do that. As long as you're using um, a web server that supports both. Like, if you're using a HTTP2 only web server, then there's no way you'd have to build, like, your own thing that works. So, you could send HTTP1 requests to, like, Eli or something and HTTP2 requests to Cowboy, which I know people have done, uh, to Chatterbox, which I know people have done. Hey, Gary, I'm wondering after September 22nd, <laughs> if you were releasing a new library um, or a new backend for an application, um, would you consider just supporting HTTP2? Um, I wouldn't, but well, it depends. So if you're in control of the clients, uh, like if you're building mobile applications or something where you're in control of both the client and the server, then you definitely can because you know HTTP2 will be available. If you're targeting the web, um, it depends on the browser support you want. Um, and also you need HTTPS as well for browser support. It, so. Uh, which you should be doing anyway, probably you know in, in this year. But um, <laughs> but yeah, if it, so it depends largely on browser support. Um, if you know that all your clients are going to be using Chrome, then go for it. It's fine. I would definitely recommend it. Um, if not, then you'll probably want to fall back to use both. Huh? Did I say JavaScript? No, <laughs> I'm I'm saying JavaScript. Oh, okay. I apologize for that. I'm just curious. I mean, like in uh, uh, JavaScript relies on the browser support for HTTP2 as well. Then. So, um, so you've got to have browser support for H2 in order to make a front-end application that, that'll communicate over H2, I'm, um, I'm guessing? Is so, that so, how it works? So the, a the API is the same. So you can still like, use the fetch um, API or like XML HTTP request, um, and you just pass the URL. So the URL is the same. So I probably should have mentioned HTTP2 is like, designed to be backwards compatible um, with HTTP1. So if you've got like a, a JavaScript client already and you just enable HTTP2 on your server, then it'll just happen over HTTP2. Like as long as your server supports it, you'll be fine. So thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, just curious about especially the um, one of the last slides where you argue that maybe um, static path and automatically push the assets would be a good idea. Uh, I was wondering about the net network congestion because uh, some time ago, I read an article about HTTP2 and saying, yeah, push is great, everyone's so looking forward to this and so on and so forth, but when you don't do it properly, then you basically shoot yourself in the foot and uh, how, you know, uh, all the network things have been 
you know, pile upon another and being like increasing the window uh, little by little, you know, and push basically, if you don't do it properly, just destroys all those, um, you know, uh, innovations, should I say? So, I, I mean, I never said it was a good idea. I just said it was an idea. <laughs> um, oh, um, yes, yeah, so, like, yeah, you're totally right. You shouldn't server push every single asset, which is why, um, which is why it may not be a good idea. Um, so we could always like, make it optional um, or not do it at all, or have like a static path and push function so it's more explicit about the side effect. Um, so you could do something like that. But you're right, you definitely, definitely don't server push every single asset. Um, if Plug were to support Cowboy 2 and HTTP 2, would, they also, would, would we also probably do WebSocket support out of the box in as well because they're so similar or? Yeah, C Cowboy 2 supports WebSockets. Um, Did the API change at all? Uh, not much, if I recall correctly. Um, the handler is pretty, if you look at the diff for the handler, it's pretty much the same. It's like maybe one or two line changes. It's not, it's not huge. But seriously, how did you get those clocks on your slides? <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Wow. Um, yeah, I use, I use React.js for my slides because I hate myself. Um, <laughs> so there is a React clock plugin that I, I position absolute in the top left, right, uh, top left. You can't have top left, right? That's not a thing. Uh, I position the top left and just go wild. Refresh the page when you start. That's the important part. Otherwise, you'll be like halfway through it. Thanks for the question. We have time for one more question. Okay. Is it about the magic trick? I love magic tricks. Um, so if you have multiple application instances behind something like HAProxy, um, do persistent connections have issues working across that if your applications aren't like in a shared node, like they all have no knowledge of each other? Um, it depends on the proxy. I don't know about HAProxy. I know the Amazon um, Elastic Load Balancer only supports HTTP2 from the client to the load balancer. Once you get behind the load balancer, it only supports HTTP1, uh, which I found out the fun way after a few hours of debugging. Um, so I don't know, HA proxy may do something similar where it says HTTP2 between the client and the proxy, and then just HTTP1 between the proxy and the back end. Um, I know it's quite a common pattern at the moment. Um, so it depends on the proxy, I guess. Okay. I anticipate lots of fun finding that out for us too then. Thanks. Definitely will. It's great fun. So I think that's it. So thank you very much.